Well, hi, Levon. Hi. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with this, um, but I'm so glad that it works for you. So, oh, here comes Angela. Great. Uh, Hello. <gasps> hi. Hi, Levon. Hey. Hello. Hey, Amanda. Hi. <laughs> hi. I, I love your your world, your small world. I wish I could just walk into it. <laughs> if we were facing the other direction, you'd have even more fun. Amanda, can we adjust your frame just a little bit so that that piece of artwork isn't um, growing out of your head? I know, it was last week too. Well, here we are all together. Levon, um, Angela probably told you, but this is our final episode of this, like at least of this first run of, of House Calls. So you are the grand finale. <laughs> Let me tell you, there's only one thing that that makes me feel better than a grand entrance, and it's a grand finale. Welcome to House Calls, a University of Michigan Institute for the Humanities Gallery web series where we've been checking in with artists across the state to see how they're doing, what they're making, not making, what they're thinking during these unprecedented times. This is our last episode, episode 10, at least for now. Today we are visiting with, and I'm honored to be visiting with this person, uh, Levan Kofafian. Uh, say hi, Levan. Hello. <laughs> Hey, they are joining us from Detroit, um, and I would like to begin by introducing everyone. I am Angela Abiodun, um, the Collaboration and Outreach Manager for the Gallery at the Institute for the Humanities. And then we are also joined by Amanda Krugliak, the Arts Curator at the Institute for the Humanities. Hello. Uh, we're also oh. jo uh, joined by Juliet Heinley, the Arts Production Coordinator at the Gallery. Hey, Levon. Hi. 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 <laughs> Levan Kafafian is a textile artist, writer, singer, and performer whose Armenian heritage is woven into their artistic practice, including their reading of coffee grounds as storytelling. Believing that objects become activated when used, what they make has a functionality, whether protective, as in the numerous scarves and shawls, Ceremonial, as in the fabrics, garments, and pottery produced for their ongoing series of interactive performances, or else as constituent elements of short video pieces. Levon collaboratively operates the Fringe Society, an arts collective that creates interdisciplinary, experimental, futuristic, and hybrid works. All of their projects engage the space between disparate elements, investigating the intersections of identity, culture, nature, and place. Thank you for joining us today, Levon. Absolutely. Thank you for that wonderful <laughs> introduction. I mean, it's all truth. And when <laughs> the truth is beautiful, that makes it all the more easier. <laughs> mm. um, so to start us off, how are you doing? I am feeling always on all days. It is quite a time that we have entered as a nation, as a world. Um, and it's just a lot of emotions and processing to go through. So um, I'm fine, no longer cuts it. That is yeah. so true. Yeah. I was talking with a friend that, and acknowledging the fact whenever I get asked the question, how are you doing? In this moment, the first guttural response is to laugh. Mm -hmm. And, <laughs> and yeah. that is an acknowledgement of the all ways, all days type of feeling. Um, and like, what can you do that is succinctly answering that question, but not just a brush off, I'm okay. Cause yeah. are we truly? That's the question. That is the question. Um, I So part of what I've been doing just to jump the gun a little bit, um, but in reference to how I'm <laughs> doing and how I'm feeling, um, I've just been having an inordinate number of long conversations with close <laughs> friends. Um, sometimes long conversations with family, depends, mm -hmm. um, but just, 
having the space to have a long, drawn out conversation about how we're living through this time and how we're processing through the feeling of being in it yeah. is necessary. It's not just helpful, it's necessary. I could not be here in front of you right now if I didn't have like three hours of phone time a day. And I would wonder if we yeah. always needed that, right? Like, I I think this moment is exasperated by the like, in the enormous amount of death, the um, the worldwide attention to um, police brutality, and so with those on top of still living in you know a capitalistic society and still having these expectations around production. It's like, what else are we to do but release? Um, mm. And talking in safe spaces is one of those ways. That is a, a way of storytelling. You know, that's a way of keeping our oral history, um, even if no one is recording or documenting it for the future. Before the coronavirus became the issue, um, part of my daily practice was to go out and be social. Hmm. period. So um, in particular, I would go to cafes and then pretend to do work on my computer. Um, <laughs> uh, less pretend, more really try hard to do work and yeah. not accomplish it. Um, but being in those spaces and especially cafes that I'm familiar with and I know the staff and I know the regulars, it really changes the landscape of a day. Um, yeah. And those spaces allowed me to have that time to process daily and weekly events, mm -hmm. um, the latest meme, <laughs> uh, discussing my projects, you know, like a lot of my work takes a stupidly inordinate amount of time to develop conceptually. Like I just, I sit on ideas for so long before implementing any part of it and talking through and processing the ideas is such a necessary part of that practice for me. Mm. So I'm always looking to have a good conversation with a friend and talk about what <laughs> I'm working on. Um, I think too, those uh, in your work is, is very much about this, those connections, you know, these moments of connection that we have in the world and whether it's just a gesture or how we, how we are interwoven, right? Mm. That there's, there's a way that just these small moments and opportunities to talk, to engage, to hear an idea, how that feeds all of us. Absolutely. Yeah. Can we see I, some of, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm, I'm just going to prompt into the, the yeah. studio please, tour. Please tell you, what? what do you want to see? <laughs> Can you Everything. show us some work? Um, oh, actually, actually. Um, I wanted to show you some of the things that I've been working on during this time. Um, and I just so happen to have some right here at the loom. So <laughs> this is um, a crochet piece. And I'm just going to like keep moving through crochet pieces for a minute. Um, these are shawls or mantles, wow. what wow. have you. Um, and all of these crochet works have been something that I have been working on while watching Star Trek. I, I saw the photos of these. Yeah, I didn't right. realize the size of them. So this mm -hmm. sits right here very nicely. It can also, so some of them are quite large and others are more bandana shaped. So they can just yeah. be cute little wraps. But yeah. um, when we, when the shutdown started and we had to stay at home, um, I couldn't do anything for like a week. And about a weekend, I started to find a rhythm to it and found some time to get to my studio, collect as much yarn as I possibly could. And even that didn't put a dent in my collection. <laughs> <laughs> Your I yarn have what's collection. called, I have a hoard is yeah. what it's called. Um, <laughs> And so I just went, I grabbed as much as I could and I started arranging color palettes and somehow I landed on this one sh style shape 
mm -hmm. um, construction and went for it and just kept making and making and making as I was watching through seven seasons of The Next Generation, seven seasons of Voyager, and now I've completed five seasons of Deep Space Nine. <laughs> I have two seasons left and I am committed to going through Enterprise, even though everyone I talk to who's seen it tells me it's not worth it. <laughs> you got to watch it and make your own decision. <laughs> right. And then I can get to Discovery and Picard and there's, there's just, there's too much Star Trek to go through. There's just too much. Um, but it enables so much crochet. So it really does. <laughs> and go figure the shapes I've been crocheting are Starfleet <laughs> insignias. Uh -huh. I, I, I could not have told you that I was planning to do that. It just happened. So that's that's a little bit of that. But I've also been able to utilize the time watching Star Trek to think about um, the future and mm -hmm. speculative fiction and how we envision the future and what people thought the future might look like mm -hmm. 20 or 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, how things have changed in media since then um, it's just offered a, a, a ripe source of critique for me because uh, there are some things Star Trek did right and some things, a lot of things, they didn't. So uh, I'm just watching and I might write a piece on it at some point, but mm. I do have some woven works for you. <laughs> um, okay, so this piece is kind of large and I'm hoping you can see it. This is like a... Sh um, mm a shawl or a huge scarf mm -hmm. yeah. and I'm there. gonna try my best. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. thank you. Can you so, talk about just the hand of the fabric? Cause I can't touch it and I really no. wish I could. Like, yes. What does it feel like? How are these soft or? They are soft, <laughs> but this one, if you can maybe see how it's scrunching is yeah. mm -hmm not the most drapey fabric. It's got a lot mm -hmm. of, um, it's got yeah. thickness to it. Uh -huh. This is maybe like, um, I'm not sure how to say it, but it's, it's got a scrunch to it. This is the thick stuff and it's not to be messed with. <laughs> um, this fabric on the other hand is its sister piece. They're woven on the same um, base, the same warp. And this one has more of a color change effect mm, yeah, to it. Yeah. Can you talk about the ends too? Do you not, you hand knot these ends, are some left undone, are they the same so length? You know? These are, let me try and grab a bunch. These are mm -hmm. all corded. I wonder if I can demonstrate. Uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> The two sets of strands are spun together in one direction. Mm -hmm. And then when they're tight enough, you bring them together and spin them in the other direction until they're tight enough. And then uh -huh. you tie an overhand knot at the end. So these ones have their little, uh -huh. little knot. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you do that over and over and over again because you have no life. Um, <laughs> Or you're watching Star Trek. Or you're watching Star Trek um, or any other number of things. I particularly like to engage in that process when I'm in social spaces um, or socially distant spaces, uh, whichever the fact may be. Um, it's just something that I enjoy doing while I talk to somebody or even if I'm just in the presence of someone else. It's the antithesis to what I do on the loom because I'm stuck in one place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes I'm alone. As much as I have tried over the years to build myself situations where there are other people weaving around me, um, and occasionally that still happens, but um, yeah, it's a largely solitary affair. I wanna change that, but. Yeah, well, I was wondering like, with all with all of this time in in you know in isolation and solid and solitaire and like the way that um the like the social life of your work is is really part of your work like how has like what has this time done to the way that you're thinking about 
collaboration and performance in public or in private or like, mm. yeah, what's kind of cooking for you on with that right now? For me, basically most things have been put on hiatus. So mm. um, it's been, let's just keep connected and calls. Um, the work portion of it, I've been diving into slowly. Mm. I worked up to it, but I'm finally back at the loom and really producing, but um, a lot of the work is solitary right now. I, I might be able to occasionally like talk about it to people. I get on the phone, but um, a lot of what's going on in my work is like sinking deep into reflective development phase mm -hmm. and spending the extra time where I would normally be parsing it out with other people, asking myself, what mm -hmm. am I doing and why? Um, and to that effect, uh, one of the things that I've been working on is uh, an apprenticeship program for weavers. Um, one, that means I don't get to be alone. <laughs> and two, um, I get to, I, I want to be able to um, share yeah. like all of my skills and not mm -hmm. just the weaving, but um, the way that I incorporate weaving into other things and other things into weaving. Mm -hmm. um, I want to be able to provide a better education than I received. Mm -hmm. um, and not to say I didn't receive a great education. A lot of it was just like, go figure it out on your own. Uh, now that you have like the base tools and mm -hmm. as much as that's an important part of it, um, I wasn't trained to be a weaver. I was trained to be a fiber artist. And as such, there were a lot of other things that I had to like figure out and explore um and i appreciate that i would say from personal experience you're you're not that type of instructor <laughs> you're a lot you're a lot more um directed and clear and like hands-on step by step and that's yeah. a appreciated thing by someone who was very new to weaving when i mm. started with you um but i'm interested in the ways in which weaving and storytelling work together, but also are separate practices? Yeah. Um, so first of all, um, weaving is a process. Hmm. Weaving is about time and interaction to me. These mm -hmm. are the two like main threads that run through the, the practice. And because it's a process with so many different elements, it's like clockwork. Um, and I use that metaphor specifically because my grandfather was a watchmaker. Um, hmm. And I think there's some like artisanal craft thing that has been passed down, um, but no one else in my family is a weaver. That's an aside, but um, to get to the point of it is um, every step of the way in weaving is um, a different point in the arc of becoming. And mm -hmm. to that end, like, mm -hmm. so is a story. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're able to weave well and take the time it takes to go through each process and give it its due, um, you develop a sense for the rhythm of each different project and each different fabric, what goes into it and then what potentially images or symbols, colors, textures, what are the things that make this fabric what it is? Um, and so when I'm working on storytelling, I start with what are the colors, the textures, the materials mm -hmm. that go into it? I don't start with dialogue. I never start with dialogue. Mm -hmm. I just can't. I can't imagine what two people are going to be saying to each other in um, a world I have no idea what it looks like. Yeah. So I always start with building the world with the story mm -hmm. before I can get to that other portion. Mm -hmm. um, I think too, it's a, you know, the fabric to me of all things that uh, 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 is a trace of, of the, the hand of the yeah. hand that touched it. So 
it feels as if it becomes that trace or that artifact of of the human in interaction. Um, and philosophically, it, it also feels as if it encompasses the whole idea of raveling and unraveling of the doing and undoing of our lives, mm -hmm. that back and forth uh, and that relationship between these two places as a human being. Yeah, I would say too, um, and this thought just popped up for me, um, as the weaver, there's a certain element to um, when I have, when I meet someone who says, oh, I have one of your scarves. I'm like, oh, which one? Like, tell me, like, show me what, which one you're talking about or describe it. When they tell it to me, what the fabric looks like or they show me, um, I'm immediately transported to the story of that piece's making. making it, Where yeah. was I in my life? Where was I um, conceptually? Where was I emotionally? What mm -hmm. was going on around me at that time? And it, as I've now been a weaver for 10 years, uh, I end up going back recursively to see these pieces that I can still see the story of that time. So mm -hmm. there's something to be said about oral histories where you keep those, I hesitate to call them tapestries, but these images mm -hmm. in your mind of certain times to be able to then parse through the arc of development of how those things came to be. Mm -hmm. um, and there are sometimes things you omit and sometimes things you embellish with. And I say embellish <laughs> on purpose here. Yeah. Um, one thing I want to add, because uh, I didn't get to address it as it was happening, but um, also at this loom, I have a couple of pieces that Angela wove in this studio. <laughs> I haven't seen them complete. I'm excited. <laughs> so this, the drape on this is so lovely and it feels so nice. I haven't pressed any of these out yet, but I did wash them oh, and I corded amazing. them. Look at all these cords, but My they gosh. are quite lovely. Wow. Oh, wow. They oh. came out well. The, look at how that drapes. Beautiful. Oh. beautiful. <laughs> so the plan with these pieces is to then, um, temporarily embellish them with a stitch and then tighten that stitch, dye it, and then remove that stitch. Mm -hmm. So imparting a pattern in color um, without any extra thread. Yeah. Tie dye. Yeah, it is, it is <laughs> a kind of tie dye. Yeah, and I think um, like one of my favorite things about fabric and textiles is the way that they do really act as historic documents in so many yeah. different ways and like the way you're talking about it Levon um in terms of like the like the personal historic moment of your you know when like the context of the time that you made the thing in um you know in that way I think that like all all fabric acts can can act that way in our in right. our lives um and yeah like your your um your triangle uh, shawls that you've been making too are like absolutely a historic document of this time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's just, it's interesting for me to interact with fabric, especially uh, vintage or antique fabrics, um, and even my own fabrics, seeing how they take you to another time, mm -hmm. but that they also have such um, a deep presence in this moment. Um, yeah and potentially into the future. How does the fabric, how do we change the fabric? Do we yeah. alter yeah. the thing mm -hmm. from another time to fit into this time? It yeah. still carries that previous time, but it's it's changed and it has um, been transformed to continue yeah. being alive. Yeah, yeah. I was, I, I was thinking in this conversation, you talking about each stitch, and it makes me think also of Rashawn Rucker, who talked about every mark and the span of this series and the passing of time. And we began at a place where we just wanted to reach out and go, are you still there in this time uh -huh. of isolation? Yeah. And mm. uh, now the stay-at-home orders have been lifted abruptly, and 
we've come out of isolation and together as communities to protest racial injustice and the 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 overwhelming nature uh, of each day every day a next day mm. what what do you see as art and artists uh where are they in this and and what can they do in this moment so um some would say like nina simone that the artist's responsibility is to reflect the time in which they live mm -hmm. and as much as that is true i think that happens regardless of whether you try to or not. Um, even if you are, say, not as cognizant of what's happening in the moment, you're reflecting your experience in that time. And that may also tell us something about this time that, yeah. you know, a group of people is not paying attention. Um, for me, one of the things that, um, because I've been less physically practicing, um, and I have not been able to do any performances, installations, uh, experiences, coffee readings, you name it. Um, what I've found has been part of my role in this time individually is to um, be the weaver of people and make sure that like connections are being maintained, um, making sure that resources are being connected to um, those who don't have them or those who have them in abundance and need to be uh, directed because they don't know who needs those resources. Um, I've had one friend who works in the service industry um, who has also been a weaver in my studio and makes these incredible lacy works um, that are very complex. Her main career is a bartender and a very good one at that. Um, she has a couple of wealthy clients and has been able to direct some of those resources to other places, but she's specifically come to me to be like, I know you know some people who need some resources, so where do I go? And I'm like, well, I have somebody who's been posting a lot about specific individuals in this city who need, so let's go. Um, whew, uh, I think part of our responsibility too is to stay informed on what's happening as artists because like being an artist is being a free agent and you're not tied to necessarily an institution or um, a governing body. There's a different set of rules at play for what you can do. Um, and so I think it's up to each artist to figure out for themselves how best they can improve life for those around them and themselves too, because if you're not taking care of yourself, how can you take care of someone else? Mm -hmm. um, to that end, I am preparing an online shop on my website. My website has been silent in terms of a shop for years. Um, just because I haven't had the capacity and in-person sales have been perfectly fine. But um, at this moment, I've been talking to some friends and receiving contributions of works. Um, I'm donating all of my, all of the proceeds from everything I'm making on that website to different organizations that are providing long-term food, water, and housing security in the city of Detroit. Um, and supporting some of the, the artists directly, you know, by yeah. having their works on the site. Um, yeah, I think, I think everything you've just said really speaks to like the artist's ability and capacity to be a problem solver and yeah. to mm. be, to be flexible and malleable in terms of, yeah, like where, where they, where they put that kind of work. Yeah, it's the question is, where do you feel you are needed in this moment? Yeah. <laughs> and a few weeks ago, I had a very different idea of where I was needed mm. in my bedroom, like that. Yeah. Um, just watching my Star Trek and crocheting away. And the events have told me otherwise. 
So I think a lot of it is just making sure to reflect personally mm -hmm. yeah. as an artist, as, as an individual. Yeah. And figuring out how best that you can serve the needs of others. Yeah, and re realizing that there are multiple ways to do that. Mm -hmm. It makes me think of the cloth, you know, of the cloth having a purpose, having a function, mm -hmm. having a, a, it serves something. And at the same time, it, it's about so many things. Yeah. To that end, I would like to state that I've always had trouble making samples um, in the weaving profession, the hand weaving profession. Um, one says, sample small, sample often mm -hmm. before you make your big thing. Um, everything I make is a big thing. <laughs> so if I'm going to test something out, I'm testing it out big yeah. as a full piece. <laughs> like this scarf is a sample, this shawl is a sample, this blanket, whatever I'm making. Mm -hmm. Like I really, I have a box full of cutoffs and samples from mm -hmm. like a longer piece where I just like sample after sample after sample. Um, and then I made the mistake of cutting them because I didn't like them. So I have this like tiny little things and I'm like, what, what's the purpose? Yeah. Mm. I'm imagining one day they might be pockets. I want to patch, patches on things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> repair, repair pieces. Repair. <laughs> And that's a whole nother conversation to get into about Mending. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's for season two of House Calls. Yes! <laughs> so you've been really active. You've, you've shown us like a little bit of what you've created during this time, but I've seen photos of maybe like 10 to 15 of the Star Trek fleet pieces that you've made. Um, I don't know if that would be the answer to this question, but what's been keeping you grounded and hopeful mm. and motivated? The weather, for one. Um, yes. That has been a super big thing. Um, I also have the phone calls with friends mm -hmm. that are really helping to set me down on the ground. Um, and two, I, have, uh, I live in a house with a fluctuating number of people. Um, mm -hmm. But let's just say about four to five and having a small social unit has been extremely helpful in keeping me grounded. Same, my, my housemates have a thousand percent gotten me through on so many nights. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that and I mean, it kind of comes back to like this, like the social aspect of your work, like ha like the mm -hmm. the exchange. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Levon. Yeah. You yeah, offered thanks, us thank you. a lot to think about in regards to weaving and storytelling and staying in your lane and finding your lane in regards to the world and what you can contribute to it. And uh, switching lanes if you, as needed. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, and before, we sign off. We're going to do things a little differently today to end. Um, we'd like to thank all of the artists who have joined us in this series. Yeah, uh, Sarah Rose Sharp, who piloted this series with us from Detroit back in March, um, as well as Sajeev Vishveshwaran, Judy Bowman, Mandy Kano Villalobos, and Lavinia Hanachuk. Rashan Rucker, Yanazaro. Ricky Weaver, Ijana Cortez, and of course, today's guest, Levon Kafafian. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Levon. Thank you. And, it's really been a pleasure. And uh, thank you as well to everybody in the audience that has joined us over these 10 weeks. It has been truly great to hold community with you in this way. Yeah. Thank you every person who has tuned in, every artist who's who's been a part of the series. This has um, been a transform. I, I feel, I, maybe I'm speaking for the team a bit here, but I feel it has been a, a transformative um, exchange in this time. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank Bye. you, guys.
Thanks. We look forward to Thanks. seeing everybody in person. <laughs> yeah. yeah. See ya. Take care. See you. See you. Bye. See ya. Bye. Thank you.